A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain, Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, Ye must be born again. Ye children of men, attend to the word so solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord. And let not this message to you be in vain, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. O ye who would enter that glorious rest, and sing with the ransom the song of the blessed, the life everlasting if ye would obtain, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again, ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. A dear one in heaven thy heart yearns to see, at the beautiful gate may be watching for thee. Then list to the note of this solemn refrain, ye must be born again, ye must be born again, ye must be born again. I verily, verily say unto thee, ye must be born again. Hello, my dearly beloved friend, and welcome to the Old Landmark Baptist Bible Trail. I'm Brother BJ, and uh, this is the Bible study program of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we're very glad that you've chose to, to join us today for our online Bible study, and we hope that you receive a, a prayer. Uh, we, that you, we pray that you receive a blessing from uh, being with us today. Um, today's subject is the subject of being born again. Our Bible lesson is going to be found in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. Uh, this is one of the, the, the most precious sections of the Word of God. It's all inspired by the Lord. Amen. But this particular section teaches us, Jesus teaches us, that we must be born again. Uh, I've personally used this section of the Bible to, to witness to many people, to, to, to lead people to the Lord. Um, it is one of the best passages for teaching people people about how to be saved. And so I would encourage every Christian to learn this passage forward and backwards, um, to learn its meaning, to learn how to teach it. And for those of you who don't know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, or you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, I, I would greatly hope and pray that you would pay close attention to the lesson uh, today and possibly, um, you know, in, in the next time we, this is Friday, so tomorrow we're going to be having a little bit different program, but we'll be back on Monday picking up where we left off with our wagon train through the Word of God. But if you're not saved or you don't know if you're going to heaven, I encourage you to, to pay particular attention to these lessons and to open your heart to what God's Word has to say. At this time, we're going to have a prayer and then we'll sing another song unto the Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you so very much for your love. Lord, we thank you for loving the world, for loving each and every one of us, for laying down your life on the cross of Calvary that the, your blood might wash away our sins. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your resurrection and the gift of eternal life that you provide to whosoever will. Lord, today I pray that you would bless the teaching of your word. I pray, dear God, that you would just hide me behind your cross and give me the grace I need to preach this lesson in a way that would be understood and, Lord, applicable to all who hear it. Please be with all those who are sick 
Thank you, dear God, for the blessings you've already sent, those that were sick and are better. Lord, we just ask you to continue to watch over us all and to get us through this time of hardship in our nation. Forgive us of our sins. Have your will and your way in our lives. All these things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, our next song is going to be number five, uh, excuse me, number 263. Number 263. Look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. The message unto you I'll give. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I have a message full of love. Hallelujah. A message, oh my friend, for you. Tis a message from above. Hallelujah. Jesus said it and I know tis true. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word. Hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. I will tell you how I came, hallelujah, to Jesus when he made me whole. T'was believing on his name, hallelujah, I trusted and he saved my soul. Look and live, my brother, live, look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Amen. All right. Well, at this time, let's grab our Bibles and uh, open up to the Gospel of John, chapter number three, starting a new chapter in our wagon train uh, through the Word of God today. John chapter number three and verse one is where we're going to pick up today. Beginning in John chapter 3, in verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So we're going to be looking today at a man named Nicodemus. When it says that he was a ruler of the Jews, that means that he was one of their leading religious uh, scholars. He was a Pharisee, as we see. The Pharisees were a religious sect of the Jews. There were really two sects at that time. You had the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And both groups as a whole were, were hostile to Jesus. Although there were members such as Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and others. Uh, Simon the leper comes to mind. Um, and, 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 and others that did come to Jesus. Although they, they tended to keep it secret. We see here that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. We'll talk Talk about that in a moment. But the Pharisees, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Pharisees were by far the more conservative. They actually believed in supernatural things like angels. They actually believed in um, the, the coming resurrection. The Sadducees had begun to, to merge Greek philosophy with the teachings of the Old Testament. And um, I, if, as I understand correctly, some of them had begun to, to accept what would almost be called an early form of, 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 of evolution. You know, basically rejecting the, the, the literal teachings of God's Word and, 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 and going with, 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 you know, at that point, ancient primitive science and, and, and Greek philosophy and, and, and so forth. But even though the Pharisees were more conservative and, and, and literally believed some of the teachings of the Bible, they still clung to a, a legalism. They still clung to a works-based salvation. They were still proud. They were still self-righteous. 
Um, they still, as a whole, valued their position and their power and their pride to the degree that they rejected Jesus Christ. But Nicodemus, we see, was different. He came to Jesus, we see in verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night. Why did he come to him by night? Well, because he didn't want any of the other Pharisees to know that he was going to see Jesus. You know, later we read about you know Nicodemus and uh, Joseph of Arimathea and some other Pharisees and religious leaders that they did believe on Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. Um, and now I believe that eventually they did kind of kind of come out into the open. Jesus said, "If you confess me before men." You know, I will confess you before my father. Um, and so ultimately, I do believe they did come out and, uh, and, and publicly profess Christ eventually. We don't know that for sure, but I, I feel confident that eventually they did. But at this point, Nicodemus is still lost, as we shall see. And, you know, he's, he's as we're going to see, he's seen the miracles that Jesus did, and that got his attention. He knows that something special about Jesus. We read in verse 2 again, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, that means teacher. We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles, these signs that thou doest, except God be with him. So amen. Nicodemus could see the obvious. When he sees Jesus Christ healing the lepers and giving sight to the blind and uh, curing the lame, uh, possibly even raising up the, the dead. We know Jesus eventually does that. He, he's working great miracles. And these miracles are signs. He's working great signs. And so anybody with an open heart and an open mind should have realized, as Nicodemus did, that Jesus Christ was someone special, that Jesus Christ had come from God. And so Nicodemus came to see him at night. In verse 3, we see, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily. Now remember, verily, verily, when Jesus says that, it means amen, amen. It means truly, truly. It means listen up because what I'm about to say is of extreme importance. Whenever we read Jesus use the double verilies, we need our ears need to perk up. Our hearts need to open wide. We need to, to, to we always need to do that with the Bible, but especially when Jesus is talking and even more especially when he says verily, verily. He says verily, verily. I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, why does Jesus, Nicodemus has come to him. All of a sudden, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why? Well, back up to our previous chapter for just a moment. I need just a little bit of water there. Look at the last few verses of John chapter number 2. Starting in verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed on his name. Remember we said that's people believing with, with their head, not with their heart. When they saw the miracles which he did. This describes Nicodemus. Okay, At this point, Nicodemus has not received Christ as his Lord and his Savior, but he's seen the miracles. He's believed to the extent that he at least knows that Jesus has come from God. Verse 24, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You see, as God, Jesus Christ could see men's hearts. You can't look at me and know 100% that I believe on Christ and that I'm saved. I can't look at you and, 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 and know whether or not you're saved. I believe that a lot of times we can know with 99% of surety based on our works, based on our, on our testimony of one another. We can know 100% about ourselves. But I'm talking about knowing 100% about other people. No one can see another person's heart. You can only see your own heart. But Jesus can see your heart. Jesus can see my heart. Jesus can see everyone's heart. Jesus saw Nicodemus' heart. And what he saw was a religious man. What he saw was an educated man. What he saw was a, a man who was a, as we're going to see, he was a, we saw he was a ruler of the Jews. Jesus is going to say later that he's a master of Israel. What that means was he was the teacher. We're, we're talking about a man who was probably the most prominent religious teacher of his day in the nation of Israel. 
And Jesus looked at this man who was so religious and so educated in the Old Testament, who was so prominent in the nation, and he saw a man who was lost. He saw a man who did not have the Spirit of God residing within him. He saw a man who was not on his way, no, who, who, who was on his way to hell if he died. And so Jesus got to the greatest need that this man Nicodemus had. He said, "Ye must be born again." Let me say to you, my friend, that there are a lot of people in this world who are religious. There are a lot of people in this world who are educated, educated even in the the the, the, the scriptures. I had a college teacher. And I could tell she had a great knowledge of the written facts of the Bible. But you know what? To her, this was just another book. She would put it up on the shelf next to some other ancient piece of writing like the Iliad or the Odyssey or, or uh, you know, any other ancient book of, of ancient days. It was literature to her. She had a knowledge in it. She was educated about it. But she had no spiritual understanding of it because she was lost. And we have here a man, Nicodemus. He's lost. He may even from a human standpoint have been a good man. I believe he was. But let me tell you something. You could be good from a human standpoint and still be lost. Jesus looked again. Look there at verse Two, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus brings up your mother, this, this, this concept of being born again. And he says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the word see there means to... Understand, perceive, and experience the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? That would, would require an entire lesson, many lessons in and of itself. So I'm going to have to, to kind of give you a, a, uh, a, a, a simple, um, I don't want to say watered down, but let's just say a, an abbreviated uh, teaching on it. What the kingdom of God is, is the sphere of service to God. One day, that's going to be the entire universe when God delivers up the kingdom, when Jesus delivers up the kingdom to God the Father. Um, before that, we have a phase called the millennium where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on the earth. Amen. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. But there is a phase of the kingdom that Jesus was introducing here during his earthly ministry and that we are in now, and that is the local New Testament church. And whether we're dealing with the, the local New Testament church or the millennial kingdom or the heavenly kingdom that is to come, what they all have in common is that they are the sphere of covenant service to God. If you want to be in the service of God, if you want to be in His kingdom, if you want to be empowered with both authority and actual power to carry out His will, if you want to understand the deep things of God, you must first be saved. You must first be born again. And so we pick up in verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus, like a lot of people, had his mind on earthly things. And this isn't just, you know, lost people like Nicodemus. There are times where the disciples hear Jesus teach and they have their minds on earthly things. And so they don't see the, the spiritual application of what it is that Jesus is saying. Nicodemus here is saying, Lord, you know, Jesus, are you saying that I've got to somehow get back in my mother's womb and be born again? That's not possible. I don't understand why you would, you would say something like that. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so Jesus presses on. He says in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Once again, we see that before you can enter the kingdom of God, before you can enter that sphere of covenant service to the Lord, you must first be born again. You must first be saved before you can 
become a part of God's kingdom before you can become a part of God's covenant service. Now, in this passage, there is a part that is often misapplied by many people today. He said, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born of water? Well, there are some false teachers in this world who would say that you have to be baptized to be saved. And what they like to do is they like to take this phrase, born of water, and say, well, you got to be born of the Spirit, but then you got to be born of water. You know, you got to be baptized in water. I got thirsty all of a sudden thinking about it. You got to be born of water, you know, in order to be saved. That's not what this is talking about. The Bible tells us in the epistles of Peter, no passage of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, when it says that no Scripture is of any private interpretation, that does not mean that you don't have the right to interpret the Bible for yourself and that I don't have the right to interpret the Bible for myself. There are people in this world religious leaders of different denominations and religions and, and, and so forth, they say, well, our church is what has the authority to interpret Scripture, or this man has the authority to interpret Scripture. And they would say no private interpretation applies to that. No. Everybody has not only the right, but the responsibility to interpret the Word of God for themselves. Be a barrier. Don't believe something just because Brother BJ says it, or because whoever your pastor is says it. You make sure you test what is preached from the pulpit against the Word of God. So what does it mean to have private interpretation? It means to take one verse of Scripture, ignore what came before it, ignore what came after it, ignore what the rest of the Bible says, and just make that one Scripture and twist it to mean what you want it to mean. That's what you have to do to make this Scripture mean you got to be baptized to be saved. To say, you got to, Jesus said you must be born of water and of the Spirit. In order to make it mean that, you've got to ignore what comes next. Look at the next verse. It says in verse 5, Jesus answered, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so in context here, Jesus is comparing and contrasting a physical birth with a spiritual birth. Now, I know some brethren, they say being born of water here is talking about the, the washing of the water by the Word. And yes, that is taught elsewhere in the New Testament. We are washed by the water of the Word, figuratively. The Word of God is, is, is it plays a prominent role in our salvation. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But contextually, that's not what's being talked about here. That is true. You're washed by the water of the word figuratively and spiritually, but that's not what's being taught here. Jesus is comparing and contrasting a physical birth with a spiritual birth. He's contrasting a first birth with a second birth. And Jesus, he said in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then he said, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. He didn't want Nicodemus to be confused about this. He doesn't want you to be born about to be confused about this. He goes on and says, the wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Being born of the Spirit is an invisible thing. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. The Holy Spirit of God quickens you. He makes you alive. The Holy Spirit of God seals you unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit of God then begins to, to sanctify you. You are born again when you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. You become a new creature in Christ. One of the things that this means, and I want you to listen to me, is that a birth happens at a moment in time. There is a moment in time where a baby is born into the world, where it comes from its mother's womb into the world. 
There's a lot of labor that builds up to that moment. But once that moment arrives, out comes the baby. Listen, I'm a father of five, soon to be seven children. Sister Ashley's pregnant with twins. And so we are, we, we, you know, we are overjoyed at the children that, that God has given us. But, but I have a great deal of experience in, in this area. A birth takes place in one moment of time. You are not saved by some process. You are not saved over a long period of time. If you are saved, it is because you were born again on a particular day. There must be a day, a time that you can go back to. You should be able to go back to a time when you personally place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And go to him, a time where you went to Him in prayer and called upon His name. A moment where you trusted in Him. Where you trusted in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. We look back to that. Nicodemus was still going to be looking forward to it. But the, 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 the action is the same. We look to Jesus for salvation. We're not going to get to it today, but we sang the song, Look and Live. You know, we are to look to Jesus. We are to rely on Him. We are to trust in Him just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And so to be born again is to be saved. And there needs to be a moment where that happened. I've witnessed to people who call themselves Christian. I've witnessed to people in what is commonly called the, the mainline denominations. You know, they believe a lot of times with Jesus here. But you ask them, have you ever been born again? Are you a born again Christian? And they will tell you to their face, no, they've never been born again. Folks, this isn't, you know, you say, well, you're just teaching Baptist doctrine. I'm teaching Bible doctrine. It was Jesus who said, ye must be born again. And unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, you will never, under any circumstances, enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you were born again, you will not be saved at all. Being born again is receiving Jesus. And if you will receive Jesus, He will bring you into His family. You will be born again. You will be born anew. You will be a new creature in Jesus Christ. It is that simple. We read next in verse 8. Jesus said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Once again, it's an invisible operation. When I was a, a young man, when I was just a kid, I had an old catamaran that my daddy got for me. It's one of those little sailboats. It's got two pontoons and a trampoline on it and a sail. And I would, it was quite a bit of work, but I'd row that thing out on the Ross Barnett Reservoir there in Mississippi and get that, that mast up and get that sail up. And if I ever managed to catch the wind, which was very rarely, but every so often I would, if I ever managed to catch the wind, that thing could take off like a rocket. Sometimes it'd get going so fast just by the, it had no motor. I had to row it out there, and then when I caught the wind with that sail, it'd take off like a rocket. Sometimes it'd get to going so fast that one of the, the pontoons would lift up out of the water. Let me tell you something. You can't see the wind, but it is very, very real. You can see the effects of the wind. You cannot see the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you something. You can see the effects of the Holy Spirit. I've seen the Holy Spirit take men who were wicked and godless and turn them into fine Christian men, fine fathers, fine husbands, fine preachers. When Jesus Christ truly saves somebody, when someone truly receives Jesus into their heart, you may not see the Spirit coming down and indwelling their heart, but you will be, that person will be able to say, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. You may not see any kind of visible phenomenon, but you will experience the grace and the mercy and the power of God. The, the wonderful peace that comes with being filled with the Spirit. I don't want to, to say that you have to experience the same thing that I experienced when I got saved. 
But to briefly give you my testimony, there was a, a, a day, a night actually, where I was laying in bed. I don't remember the exact date of the day. I don't remember the exact year even. The important thing is that I remember the event. I was laying in my bed one night and I suddenly was convicted of my sin. I knew that because of all the bad things I'd ever said, because of all the bad things that I'd ever done, that if I were to die, I'd go straight to hell. And I felt the entire weight of the universe weighing down on my heart. And, you know, over the course of my childhood, I had been preached the gospel by my grandparents, by my mother, by Brother Jim Brasil, my, my, my pastor when I was a little boy. Uh, when I was a little bit older kid, I, I heard a sermon by Brother Nicky Barnett, and I remember it convicted me so much I hated that man at that period of time. It was the only sermon I ever heard, heard him preach. Brother Nicky, you don't know who I am. I only heard you once. But you preached a sermon and you said, we're going to sin, but if we can sin and feel good about it, then we need to take a serious look at our salvation. I tell you what, that stabbed me in the heart. And I carried that with me. And just one day while I was laying in bed, all of that conviction came upon me. I remember a preacher when I was in the fifth grade. It was a different world back then. Amen. I got dropped off at the state fair with my buddy by ourselves. And we just ran all over the, 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 the fair. It's probably dangerous even back then. But there was this little old preacher in a suit in one of those those tents he took me and my friend aside and he, he asked us if uh you know we were going to heaven and you know what here's the scary thing i had the answer you know i believed here but i did not believe here yet but you know what he, he planted yet one more seed and there came that night where I realized how lost I was and that I was on my way to hell. And I did the only thing I knew to do. I did what I had been taught all my life by people who loved me and by churches that loved me. I cried out to Jesus to save me. I said, Jesus, save me. That was my prayer. I'd already believe. I'd, there'd never been a moment in my life where I did not believe on Jesus. I was singing Jesus loves me before I could say most other things. There's never been a time in my memory where I did not believe here. But there came a night laying in my bed in the middle of the night that I finally believed on him here. I was born again. I didn't see no spirit like a dove come down to indwell me. I didn't see no tongues of fire or hear any mighty rushing wind. But I tell you something, my friend, I felt the weight of the universe lift off of my heart. And I knew with 100% assurity at that moment, I was saved. I was forgiven. I was born again. Now, your emotional experience of salvation may not be the same as mine. But the Spirit is powerful. And when you are saved, you will know it in your heart. Receive Jesus. Believe on Him. And be born again. Let's have a closing prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you so very much for these precious people. I thank you for the members of Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. I thank you, dear God, for our Christian friends. I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's under the sound of my voice right now. Lord, for those of us who are saved, most especially those of us who are saved and baptized and members of one of the Lord's New Testament churches, I pray, dear God, that you would encourage us to do our jobs and to share you with as many people as we can, to share our testimonies, to learn passages such as John chapter number three by heart so that we can teach people about you and lead them to you so that you can save them. Lord, we know that you do all the saving, but we also know, dear God, that you have determined to use us as your tools. Dear God, we pray that you would make us worthy tools. Dear Lord, I pray for anyone listening that may be lost, that the Holy Spirit would convict them and that from the bottom of their heart, they would cry out to you for salvation and be born again before it's everlasting too late. Dear God, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for all you do for us. All these things we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, let's sing our final hymn for today. And we'll pick back up in John chapter number three next Monday. Tomorrow is Saturday. We will have a program and it will be a continuation of last Saturday's doctrinal lesson. But for our final song, we're going to sing number 540. Number 540. 
The cross upon which Jesus died is a shelter in which we can hide, and its grace so free is sufficient for me, and deep is its fountain, as wide as the sea. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned, the Savior still waits to open the gates and welcome a sinner before it's too late. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. The hand of my Savior is strong, and the love of my Savior is long. Through sunshine or rain, through loss or in gain, the blood flows from Calvary to cleanse every stain. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Amen. For the Landmark Missionary Baptist Bible Trail and for Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Wichita, Kansas. We love you. We thank you for being here. We hope to see you again tomorrow. God bless you.